Hey bees, I'm Marie from Humble Bee and Me, and today we are tackling part two of my two-part content cluster on ingredients for new formulators. Shopping for ingredients as a new formulator can be really overwhelming, so I have designed this two-part bit of content to help you buy what you need to make the widest array of different types of products so you don't spend a couple hundred bucks and then find out that you can really only make fancy lip balms. I want you to be able to make all kinds of things, lotions and creams and cleansing balms and hand wash and all kinds of fun stuff. And so that is what we were talking about today. Part one was all kinds of ingredients for making balms and butters and whatnot. And today we are introducing a lovely suite of ingredients that will allow you to kind of springboard part one into heaps of other awesome skincare fun things. If you haven't checked out part one yet, please make sure you do that. And as a reminder, there are full partner blog posts for both part one and part two, and they have so much extra super helpful information in them. I've linked to the Humble Bee and Me encyclopedia entries for the ingredients so that you can learn more about them. I have discussed alternatives and possible upgrades and everything is just you know written down. So if you need to quickly reference like, oh, how much of that ingredient did you say I should buy? Uh, it is all there. So definitely make sure you check that out. It is linked in the description box below. Also linked in the description box below is a sign up link for a all new, totally free formulation masterclass that Formula Botanica is offering. You might know that I have two diplomas from Formula Botanica, one in organic hair care formulation and one in organic skincare formulation. I learned a ton in those courses and if you would like to read my reviews of those courses, I've linked to those in the description box below as well. But if you are interested in trying out what Formula Botanica offers or like a bit of it for free, definitely check out that masterclass. I've had a sneak peek of it and it looks really lovely. Before we dive into the ingredients, I do want to continue to emphasize to start with inexpensive ingredients. And so that's not just the ingredient itself, but also keep in mind shipping costs and import fees. If you really want an ingredient, but you can only order it from the other side of the world, if you have any other options, I would start with the ingredient that you don't have to order from the other side of the world because that can get really expensive really, really quickly. Ideally, we want our starter ingredients to be so inexpensive that if you make something that is utterly wretched with them, it's not too upsetting to chuck it out and to try again. I also really want to emphasize the importance of researching your ingredients. It is so important to research your ingredients and to know your ingredients. And I have done a two part series on how to research your ingredients, you know, the type of information that you should be looking for and why, why it's helpful. And then part two is all about where to go looking for that information and where to find it. So yeah, as a formulator, ingredient research is so, 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 so important. It will give you a massive leg up in the world of making. So please make sure you check out that uh, two-part blog series as well. Without further ado, let's dive into part two of 10 DIY ingredients for new formulators. The first ingredient for part two, so technically ingredient number six, is distilled water. Distilled water is our very basic wet, watery thing. It's the water in your lotion. It's the water in a foaming hand wash. It's the water in a toner, in a shampoo. It's, it's the water. <laughs> we prefer distilled water to something like tap water because distilled water is just water. It has been distilled to remove trace minerals and metal ions that can occur in tap water and well water and mineral water that can cause problems in our formulations. So I buy my distilled water just at the grocery store in four liter, roughly one gallon jugs. I also use it in my iron and my clothing steamer. So it's generally a very useful thing to have around. And then when I'm formulating with it, I do decant it into a little like a smaller bottle. So it's just a little bit more wieldy and I've put a little disc kind of flip top on this bottle so I can, it's a little squeeze bottle so I can just very gently dispense you know, wee amounts of water if I need to. This is a lot easier to work with than this, but yeah, these are you know, a couple dollars at the grocery store 
and a essential thing to have in your formulating pantry. If you can't get distilled water where you live, please make sure you are referring to the blog post. I've linked to an article from Chemist's Corner about the different types of water that we use in formulating, different options that might be available to you. If your tap water is pretty boring, you know, if it doesn't you know, smell really sulfurous or if it's not really, really mineral heavy, that can work. And it is also possible to distill your own water at home. So yeah, please make sure you are reading the partner blog post. The next ingredient that you should definitely have in your DIY pantry is a complete emulsifying wax. You will use emulsifying wax in all kinds of emulsions, so lotions and creams and cream cleansers, but then you can also use it in anhydrous products to give them rinse off. So it can be that cleansing ingredient in a cleansing balm. The emulsifying waxes I'm recommending today are really easy to work with and make it just an absolute breeze and pleasure to create stable, gorgeous emulsions. If you've only got room in your budget for one emulsifying wax, I would start with a non-ionic self thickening emulsifying wax. So the easiest one to get is generally emulsifying wax NF. It is cetyryl alcohol and polysorbate 60, comes in little kind of like white beads or pellets and is very, very easy to work with and creates beautiful emulsions. If you are looking for a natural alternative, Olive M1000 is a good choice as well. If you really wanna make hair conditioners, you might wanna choose something cationic instead of something non-ionic. So you can get BTMS 25 and BTMS 50 and they are both really lovely and very easy to work with and create gorgeous, just absolutely gorgeous hair conditioners. You can also use those cationic emulsifying waxes to create regular lotions and creams. And another emulsifying wax to consider that I absolutely love is glycerol stearate and PEG 100 stearate. So this is kind of like the driving in manual equivalent of an, of an emulsifying wax, whereas these guys are more of driving in automatic. There's a bit more to consider and to think about when working with this emulsifying wax, but you have a lot more control because it just emulsifies. It doesn't thicken our formulations. So these emulsifying waxes bring a, sort of a predetermined amount of viscosity to our formulations because they have thickeners right in them. This one doesn't. So you can control the viscosity of your emulsion independently, which is really, really cool and awesome. If you'd like to learn more about this emulsifying wax, please make sure you're reading the partner blog post. I've linked to some really helpful uh, additional blog posts I've done on working with it and on modifying formulations that call for something like Emulsifying Wax Enough or Olive M1000 to use this emulsifying wax instead. And if you are thinking about buying multiple emulsifying waxes, I'd say the first one that you should get is a non-ionic self-thickening emulsifying wax. The second one that you should get is a cationic one. So I would recommend BTMS 25 or BTMS 50. And then the third one would be glycerol stearate and PEG 100 stearate. But as always, do your research and think about what you wanna make. And of course, look at what you can buy and make your choices you know, based on what makes sense for you. When buying your first emulsifying wax, I would recommend starting with about 100 grams or 3.3 ounces. The next ingredient you'll need is a broad spectrum preservative. So this helps keep our product safe and stable. This gross looking little pot of very moldy lotion is something that I created as part of a larger preservative experiment that I did as a patron exclusive series over the course of the last year. So if you wanna check that out, please consider becoming a patron. But yeah, this had absolutely no preservatives in it whatsoever. And just, just look at it, ugh. As a general rule, you're going to want to include a broad spectrum preservative in any formulations that contain water or formulations that can come into contact with water during their lifetime that aren't a single use thing. So a bath bomb, for instance, doesn't need a preservative because it's going straight in the bath, the whole thing. So yes, obviously it's coming into contact with water, but it's getting also used up right away. Or something like a scrub that might be taken into a bath or a shower and have like wet hands dipped into it, that you would either want to make sure you're putting a preservative in it or make sure that you are portioning out a single use amount of it and putting it in a shower safe little container and then taking that into the into the wet with you, using that all up in one go. Uh, and then if there's you know any leftover, you're chucking that because it's been, uh, it's gotten wet. There's a lot to learn about preservation and there are exceptions to that rule, but it's a pretty good you know, starting rule of thumb. So the preservative I recommend you start with is Liquid Germal Plus. And so I recommend this because 
It is really easy to work with, it is very effective, and it's kind of just one less thing to worry about when you are a new formulator. It is effective at quite a wide pH range, so you don't need to generally worry about testing and adjusting the pH of your formulations. I know it's really effective, I've worked with it for years and have had a very hard time getting it to fail. It works in you know, an incredibly wide array of products and it's just, it's easy and it's effective. <laughs> if you can't buy Liquid Dermal Plus where you live, there are a lot of other really effective preservatives out there, just that they all have different requirements for success, be it you know pH ranges and usage rates and incompatibilities with other ingredients. So just make sure you are doing your research. I have linked to some really helpful FAQs on that. And also if you'd like to see the results of that preservative experiment that I was talking about where I tested a wide variety of different preservatives over the course of a year to see how they performed, that's a patron exclusive. So if you would like to become a patron so you can watch those videos and see how those preservatives performed, I will include a link to my Patreon in the description box below this video. 30 grams or about one fluid ounce of preservative will last you for quite a while. Though of course do look at the usage rate for your preservative. Liquid Germal Plus has a maximum recommended usage rate of half a percent. If you are using a preservative that has a maximum recommended use of something like 2%, obviously you're going to use up something that has a 2% usage rate a lot faster than you're going to use up something that has a half a percent usage rate. And then of course it's also worth considering that that usage rate really does factor into the cost of the preservative. So yeah, start with about 30 mils or 30 grams, good, good starting point. The next ingredient that you're definitely going to need in your DIY pantry is a humectant. So humectants hold onto water. I highly recommend vegetable glycerin as your starting humectant. It is cheap, it is easy to get, you can often buy it at pharmacies. It's just, it's a really great, super versatile, super effective option. It can be tacky for sure, but I do think that its tackiness has been overblown. I have successfully made lotions that contain a whopping 30% of vegetable glycerin that you know didn't glue me into my clothes or anything. They were really awesome and really, really moisturizing. When you're buying glycerin, I would start with about 100 mils unless you are planning on making lots of body washes and uh, hand washes and whatnot because I like to put a lot of glycerin into those formulations. And so if you're planning on doing that, I would grab yourself about 500 mils to start with. And then for our last ingredient, ingredient number 10, I'm actually splitting this off so you kind of have two things to choose from based on what you are more interested in making or if there's room in your budget get both. If you are interested in making some foaming and lathering cleansers so things like hand wash, body wash, shampoo, I would get a blended surfactant product. When we formulate with surfactants it's best practice to combine surfactants with different charges but then that means that you have to buy a bunch of surfactants with different charges. And you can kind of shortcut your way around that, especially you know, as a new formulator, by just buying a blended surfactant product where the surfactants of various charges have been professionally blended into one bottle for you to make it very easy to work with. So two that I've worked with are Isilux Ultra Mile. This was a gift from Windy Point and Plant Upon SFNA. This was a gift from Voyager. And so I've really enjoyed working with both of these. And so they're both blends of anionic, non-ionic and amphoteric surfactants. Depending on the usage rate of the surfactant blend that you're buying, you probably wanna buy around 250 milliliters or about eight fluid ounces of product. This smaller bottle is 250 mils, whereas this larger one is 500. In the past, when I have shared formulations using blended surfactant products, I've definitely learned that the availability for them around the world is not very uniform. So if you are shopping for a product like this, what you're gonna wanna do is head over to the surfactant section of whichever you know a supplier you are shopping with and read through the descriptions of the product and you are looking for something that is described as a surfactant blend that contains anionic, non-ionic, and or amphoteric surfactants, you're looking for usually at least two of those. And if you can get all three, even better. Whatever you are buying, make sure you are researching it and reading up on it so that you know how to work with it because different ones will be 
more concentrated than others and can have different sort of formulation needs and requirements, you know, what they need to be happy and to perform their best. So make sure you are doing your research. The second option for ingredient number 10 is a solubilizer. So we use solubilizers to disperse small amounts of oil into large amounts of water. So this can be something like dispersing a small amount of oil into a hand wash or a shampoo or a body wash to make it milder. This could be something like making a room spray that's mostly water and you want to disperse a small amount of you know, essential oil or fragrance into it. Uh, and it could also be something like a bath bomb where it would contain you know, some butters and you're gonna put that in your bath and you want those butters to emulsify into the bath water, making it all lovely and milky and rich rather than coating the outsides of your bathtub and turning it into a sort of fragrant death trap. So two fairly easy to get options for solubilizers are polysorbate 80 and PEG 40 hydrogenated castor oil. Out of the two of these, I would recommend the PEG 40 hydrogenated castor oil over the polysorbate 80. I just, I find that I really like the way that this performs and it also works well as a bit of a refatting ingredient on its own, whereas the polysorbate 80 doesn't quite shine in that way. Uh, this polysorbate 80 was a gift from Yellow Bee. I'd recommend starting with around 100 milliliters of solubilizer. So this is a 120 milliliters and this is roughly twice this. This product was sold by weight so this is, is 227 grams. And that wraps up my two-part series on 10 DIY ingredients for new formulators. Please make sure you are reading the partner blog post. There's just there's a lot more information in there including some honorable mentions, some other things that you might be interested in adding to your collection that I thought, oh, they're not quite like a top 10, but I also can't not mention them. <laughs> and if you haven't watched part one yet, definitely check that out. Part one is basic and hydrous ingredients for making bombs and body butters and whatnot. And then this lovely suite of ingredients allows us to take those ingredients and make lotions and creams and cleansing bombs and all kinds of fun things. Thank you so very much for watching. Please subscribe and please make sure you are reading the full partner blog post, which is linked in the description box below this video. If you think I have forgotten anything, I would love to hear about what it is and why you think it should be one of the first 10 ingredients that a new formulator buys. So you can leave that in the comments below. I look forward to hearing what you think. But thank you very much. Have an awesome day. Happy making and I'll see you later.